Today, we focus on Object Relations Therapy, or OR, a fascinating model that developed from Freud's psychoanalytic framework. It can be highly symbolic and even metaphorical at times, and a biblical correlate may be Christ's usage of parables to describe the complexity of human nature. Object Relations is part of the psychodynamic school of therapy models which focus on un unconscious processes and defense mechanisms that influence current behavior. It's an insight-oriented approach and enables the client to examine unresolved conflicts, increase self-awareness, and work towards developing more positive relationships with others. Here's the mind map of the model we'll study today. Now, because of its high level of complexity, I thought it would be a good idea to return to a familiar case review. As you remember, we discussed Michelle in class, and hopefully this review will help us to apply object relations in a real-life setting. Please pause the video as needed to review. Now before discussing the central constructs, I want to set up some basic highlights of the object relations model. I like to think of object relations as a patchwork quilt because it was developed over several years by Melanie Klein, R.D. Fairbairn, Donald Winnicott, and Otto Kernberg. Therapy differs from traditional psychoanalytic approaches in that social attachments are emphasized over physiological impulses and sexual drives. Because a main emphasis of OR is early attachment, here's a working definition of attachment to keep in mind. Now, the object is the target of basic instincts and represents the mental image of the primary caretaking other is constructed by the very young child. Now, as this diagram shows, we create objects focusing on the self as well as of others, and each impacts the other and shapes our view of the world. As such, object relations is the nature of the inner representational world, the nature of the various self and object representations, and their dynamic and affective interplay. Now there are three main constructs of OR, namely Mahler's theory of the symbiotic orbit, objects, and the creation of a safe world. Now I will spend the majority of time discussing these constructs because of their importance in therapy. Psychodynamic models tend to be longer term models. There is definitely a therapy process which we will review. However, a lot of counseling time is spent exploring early caregiver experiences and they hinge on the foundational constructs of this model. Now, in the early 1950s, Margaret Mahler developed a model of separation individuation which described the intricate process of the early development of the child. Calling it the theory of the symbiotic orbit, she postulated that many behaviors and choices one makes in life result from this crucial early process. Mahler proposed three distinct stages and I'll highlight each of them now. Stage one is called normal autism, which takes place from zero to two months. And in this stage, the child has a fragmented self. There is no movement towards attachment. In stage two, normal symbiosis, the second to fifth month involves the infant becoming increasingly aware of the mother, but not as a separate identity. A fusion state occurs in which the child and mother symbolically fuse with one another. Now, most of the intellectual and emotional development of the child occurs in stage three, which focuses on identity, object constancy, and healthy self-esteem. The first part of this stage is called hatching, which is the beginning of separation from the mother. This occurs between five and ten months and involves the child's hatching from the symbiotic orbit smoothly and gradually. 
Now, Mahler noted clinical issues that could result if the child did not successfully complete the hatching stage. Issues included object loss and separation anxiety, and these problems, if untreated, could continue through adolescence and even adulthood. The second step of stage three is the practicing period occurring between ages 10 and 17 months in which the child begins to develop autonomous functions. Clinical issues at this step might include a grandiose self that could later lead to pathological narcissism. Now the third part of stage three is called rapprochement which occurs around 18 months and the child begins to see the mother as the, source, as the source of power and that he or she is heavily dependent on her. The child also begins to perceive the cognitive and perceptual permanence of objects. Now the fourth step of stage three is object constancy, which is considered a developmental leap in which a gradual internalization of functions occurs leading to a separate, self-regulating self. The child is able to tolerate loving and hostile feelings towards, towards the same object. Clinical issues include dependency and depression due to the threatened loss of the love of the object, and this might occur if the mother were distant and withheld her love from the child. Now, according to Mahler, the most important transitory step in the adaptation to reality is the one in which the mother is gradually left outside the omnipotent orbit of the self. If we had to discuss Michelle's early functioning through the lens of the symbiotic orbit, one thought is that she may have successfully navigated each stage of development. However, because her family consistently moved from place to place, it may have been difficult for her to establish a sense of permanence of objects. She may have thus had difficulty navigating the rapprochement phase of stage three. Now one more thing about the symbiotic orbit construct. You may be thinking that it would be difficult to go back and pinpoint experiences at such an early age. But keep in mind that through deep exploration of childhood dynamics and early caregiver experiences, a lot of vital information can be obtained about this era of the client's life. Now the second central construct is objects. We can think of objects as external, as in people and things in the environment, and internal, meaning that they are developed as a result of interactions with important others, such as care, caregivers. An important dynamic is the good breast, bad breast, and because the breast is essentially the first entity that the child comes in contact with, it is considered the first object. The caretaker, usually the mother, nurtures the infant's attachment, and the personality is formed through interactions with others. Now the third and final central construct is creating a safe world, which we accomplish through introjection, projection, and splitting. These three constructs can also be thought of as defense mechanisms, which are mental processes that are initiated often unconsciously to avoid conscious conflict or anxiety. Now, introjection is internalizing aspects of the world, such as people's behaviors, to make them safer. For example, we might internalize Lincoln's qualities of character or imagine that we are superheroes in order to help us internally make the world a safe place for us. Here's what Michelle's introjection might have looked like while growing up. Next is projection, in which feelings about the object are fused with the object and projected onto the external world so that they are safer. An example is the happy infant projecting positive feelings onto the breast, making it the good breast. And here is an example of how Michelle may have experienced 
projection. Finally, there's splitting, which is a way of managing the good and bad affect by splitting the two and repressing the bad press, which can lead to internal chaos and objects that are fragmented. An example of which is Michelle's view of God, which we'll talk about more in a minute. If we repress the bad affect internally, it is more difficult to navigate the emotional ebb and flow of life. Now, this is essentially an overview, and we'll spend more time discussing these three concepts in class. Let's move to case conceptualization, which involves four steps. Please pause the video for review and note that I will focus on the first one as it applies to the case of Michelle. In Michelle's case, we want to first look at her current and early relationships as they relate to her attachments and her autonomy. What other elements about Michelle would we consider for this first step when conceptualizing her case? Now, the main goals of object relations therapy are to develop the capacity to resolve splitting and to integrate the various internal objects into, whole, into holes. In Michelle's case, this would mean helping her to manage the positive and negative emotions about her mother's death and her husband's infidelity. Also, integrating fragmented objects such as her view of God, which had been uprooted during her marriage into a healthier or whole object in which, both, in which both good and bad feelings could be managed and tolerated. By doing this, she would develop a greater capacity to manage conflicting feelings such as hatred and love, and she could return to a place of loving God when both good and bad things happen to her. Ultimately, our goal is to restore the healthy object relations in the client's life. Now, here are some of the interventions and techniques of object relations, and you'll see that the relationship between therapist and client is crucial, as well as interpretation and the analysis of both transference and countertransference. Another important intervention is dream analysis, and you got a demonstration of this in Yalom's story, In Search of the Dreamer. Now, on a cultural level, because object relations is about relationships, it can adapt to various cultures, but the focus on individual growth may be problematic with collectivistic cultures. So please keep in mind that cultural differences between therapist and client should be brought out in the open during the therapy process. Now, according to Klee, the process of object relations therapy involves eight stages. Note that certain stages would be critical and may last longer than others. In these stages, the client would exhibit maladaptive behaviors such as splitting, and the therapist would generate empathic confrontation, setting boundaries, but also showing empathy and care instead of scorn and even an abandonment, which the client may be accustomed to receiving. Over time, and as a result of a strong therapeutic relationship, older negative patterns would be replaced by more adaptable ways of relating to others. With this in mind, what would one of these stages look like if Michelle were a client in object relations therapy? Also, review the therapy video and try to determine which stage the therapist, Jill Scharf, is at with the client. And finally, one of the most famous examples of the realization and interpretation of dreams occurs with the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Please review this story and then consider what might be the spiritual implications within one or more of your own dreams. At this point, you may be intrigued by the object relations approach, yet you may also be thinking, what if I wind up in a practicum setting where many of my client cases are short term? Is there a way to utilize psychodynamic principles in a therapy setting designed for clients with limited funds and or less time for counseling? 
The answer is yes, and Hannah Levinson's brief dynamic therapy model called Time-Limited Dynamic Psychotherapy, or TLDP, could be a workable solution for you. Please pause the video to read this quote from Dr. Levinson. As you can see, research supports TLDP as an effective treatment approach, so I'll now cover a few of the main features of this model. There are nine fundamental principles of TLDP, and please compare these tenets to the object relations model we just studied. First, people are innately motivated to search for and maintain human relatedness. Maladaptive patterns in relationships are acquired early in life, become schematized, and underlie many presenting problems. Relationship patterns persist because they are maintained in current relationships and are consistent with the person's sense of self and other. Remember how we characterized the self and the other when discussing object relations therapy. Therefore, in TLDP, clients are viewed as stuck, not sick, and the focus in TLDP is on shifting maladaptive patterns and their attendant emotions. TLDP is concerned with interactive processes rather than specific content. The model focuses on one chief problematic relation, relationship pattern, not a series of problems, and the therapist is both a participant and an observer. Ultimately, the change process will continue after the therapy is terminated. Now here are 13 steps that encompass three important categories in TLDP, starting with assessment. The therapist allows the client to tell his or her own story, conducts an anchored history or one that may be structured around the chief relationship pattern that will be addressed in therapy. The therapist also attends to the emotional flavor of the story, including both verbal and nonverbal signs, explores the emotional interpersonal context related to symptoms and problems, and uses the client's cyclical maladaptive patterns, called, sometimes called CMP, to gather, organize, and probe for information. Now the next series of important steps in TLDP revolve around case conceptualization. In this process, the therapist listens for themes in the client's behaviors and emotions as they apply to past and present relationships, is aware of his or her own countertransference, is vigilant for reenactments of dysfunctional interactions in the therapeutic relationship, and develops a narrative describing the client's predominant dysfunctional emotional interactive pattern. Does this remind you of any of the models we've studied previously? And finally, treatment planning represents the final important steps in TLDP in which the therapist uses the client's cyclical maladaptive patterns to formulate the new experiences that might lead to more adaptive relating. It uses these patterns to formulate what new interpersonal understandings might lead to more adaptive relating revises and refines the cyclical maladaptive patterns throughout the therapy process. And for each of these steps, considers the influence of cultural factors on client functioning. I hope you will take time to find out more about Hannah Levinson's time-limited dynamic psychotherapy. Have a great week.